Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part seven, The Secret Rites of Mithra from A History of Secret Societies by Archon Daral. Chapter six, The Secret Rites of Mithra. The cult of Mithra, intercessor between man and the Persian divine power, Ormuzd, was once an extremely widespread one. From its origins in Persia, the faith spread to Babylonia, Greece, and finally the Roman Empire, where it struggled against Christianity at the latter's inception. Christianity won with the decline of the material virtues of the Romans, but there are people who worship the solar deity yet, and even London has its Mithra temple. Mithra was said to give his worshippers success in this world as well as security and happiness in the next. He was originally a genie, the worldly representative of the invisible power which ruled the affairs of men. Later, and the cult probably has a history of over 6,000 years, he became thought of by his devotees as being not just one of the 28 genii, but the only one which mattered, and the only one who could cater for the wishes and needs of the people. Thus it was that the ancient Aryan worship of Ahura Mazda, the supreme being, was displaced by that of one of his representatives. Although archeological research has produced little to give a clear picture of the rituals and beliefs of the Mithraists, a considerable amount of secret law still survives in the East from India to Syria, which gives one a good idea of exactly how the members of the cult thought and what their magical ceremonies were. Three ritualistic objects are used by Mithraists. The crown, equivalent to the sun and power of the supernatural kind. The hammer or club, symbolizing creative activity of mankind and the bull, which stands for nature, virility, increase. By the proper understanding of these objects and what they represent, Mithraists have it that the ordinary man can transcend his environment, can become great or successful, or can achieve what he wants to do, and enters a delightful afterlife. What must he give in exchange? Nothing but worship to the principle which presides over all destiny. One reason for the loss of importance of the cult undoubtedly is that admission was restricted to those who were thought worthy to receive the blessings which would come through the proper beliefs and use of the magical powers presided over by the Mithra priests. Christianity, for instance, was open to a far greater section of the population, even although the Christian mysteries were not accessible everywhere to all until relatively late. At the same time, some of the Mithraist ceremonials were of such obvious emotional appeal that scholars are agreed that the purely ritualistic side of Christianity owes much to those of the sun god of the Persians. The lowest degree of initiation was known as the sacrament and could be administered to anyone, theoretically, who could be relied upon to keep a secret and who would eventually develop into a regular and devout worshiper. This degree was called that of the crow, and it symbolized, according to present-day Mithraists, the death of the new member, from which he would arise, reborn as a new man. This death spelt the end of his life as an unbeliever and canceled his allegiance to former and unaccepted beliefs. The use of the word crow probably derives from the ancient Persian practice of exposing their dead to be eaten by carrion birds, which is still carried on by the Parsi community in India, who follow parts of ancient Iranian religion as supposedly taught by Zoroaster. But if the crow symbolized death, it was also the delegate privilege to take over the human body after death. This meant that in a sense it was superior to humanity. Thus it was that the member of the cult was superior to the ordinary run of mortals. The candidate descended seven steps into the temple, which was an underground one fashioned in the shape of a cavern and made to look as much as possible like a natural cave. Initiation tests now took place. The newcomer was pursued by wild beasts, priests in animal skins demons and all sorts of terrors. He had to fast for three days. In this debilitated, altered and plastic state, he was given a lecture by a priest on the responsibilities which were now his. Among these were the necessity to call brother, only those who had been initiated. All family ties were severed. Nothing mattered except doing one's job well and carrying out the worship of Mithra. The final ceremony took place amid the clash of cymbals, the beating of drums and the unveiling of a statue of Mithra himself. This latter showed Mithra as a man carrying a bull by the hind legs. Now the symbolism of this piece of sculpture was explained to him. The bull, in addition to symbolizing fecundity, was representative of animal passion. It was through invocations to Mithra that mankind first discovered how to overcome this force and how to discipline himself. Therefore, the secret of religion was partly that the worshiper must restrain himself physically in order to attain power over himself and over others. 
This graphic teaching of the diversion of sexual power into psychic channels shows that the Mithraists followed in essence the pattern of all mystical schools which believed in the production of power through discipline. In this, they are clearly distinguished from the more primitive and less important orgiastic schools which merely practiced indiscriminate indulgence, mass immorality, and so on. The neophyte then drank a little wine from the symbol to show that he realized that the symbol is the means whereby ritual ecstasy comes, which puts him in touch with the higher powers. Two long lines of initiates knelt on either side of the low stone benches which traversed the crypt as the new member, accompanied by the priests who were initiating him, walked along the central aisle for the eating of the bread. A number of pieces of dry bread were placed on a drum, similar to those which were being softly beaten by one of the priests. The candidate ate one morsel, signifying that he accepted Mithra as the source of his food. This bread, according to their beliefs, had been exposed to the rays of the sun to absorb some of its quality. And thus the worshipper was partaking of the nature of the sun itself in this ritual observance. Now he was taught the password of the cult, which was to identify him to other members and which he was to repeat to himself frequently in order to maintain the thought always in his mind, I have eaten from the drum and drunk from the symbol, and I have learned the secret of religion. This is the cryptic phrase which an early Christian writer, Matinus, reports as being taught to the Mithraists by a demon. The second degree of initiation was called the secret, and during this the candidate was brought to a state of ecstasy in which he was somehow made to believe that he had seen the statue of the god actually endowed with life. It is not likely that there was any mechanical method by which this was done, because no such apparatus has been found in Mithraic temples unearthed. The candidate was brought up to the idol to which he offered a loaf of bread and a cup of water. This was to signify that he was a servant of the god and that by what sustains my life, I offer my entire life to your service. The grade of soldier may show that the military arts were responsible for a good deal of the power of Mithra worship in ancient Persia. Certain it is in any case that this degree greatly appealed to the Roman warriors who formed a very large part of the rank and file of the cult during its Western expansion. A sign similar to a cross signifying the sun was made on the forehead of the initiate, who was thus marked as owned by the deity. A crown was placed before him, hanging from the point of a sword. This he took and placed it aside with the words, Mithra alone is my crown. The Persian crown, it will be remembered, from which pattern all present-day crowns are eventually derived, is a golden sun disk with a hole in the center for the head. It is jagged at the edges, representing the sun's rays, and these projections are turned up to make what is still known in Western heraldry as the Oriental Crown. Now the candidate has to prove himself in a mock combat with soldiers and animals in a number of caves. When the Emperor Commodus went through this degree of initiation, he actually killed one of the participants, although he was supposed only to make a symbolic slaying. Passed through the soldier degree, the Mithraist was eligible after a lapse of time to be promoted to the rank of lion. He was taken again to the cavern and honey was smeared upon his brow. As opposed to the water which had been used in his acceptance into the earlier degree, his baptism, the degree of lion was taken only by those who had decided to dedicate themselves completely to the cult and who would henceforth have no truck with the ordinary world. The lion was then a sort of priest, but rather more of a monk. He was trained in the rites of the cult and told certain secrets. The degree of Lion of Mithras could be conferred only when the sun was occupying the zodiacal sign of Leo, about July 21st to August 20th, during the Persian month of Asad, the Lion. There is a good deal of astrological lore in Mithraism and also an admixture with Kabbalistic numerology. The Greek branch of the Mithraists, for example, worked out that the numerical equivalent of the name, spelt by the Matras, was 365, and thus corresponded to the number of days in the solar year. In the purely magical sense, Mithraism has it that both the name of the god and the rank which the individual holds in the cult have magical power. Thus, if a person wants to achieve anything, he has to concentrate upon the word Mithra, while preparing for himself the ceremonial repast and beating alternately a drum and cymbals that the effect of initiation was to produce someone of upright character is amply evidenced by literature of the Roman times, in which the Mithraists were generally considered to be thoroughly trustworthy and improved people. 
Even their enemies could reproach their own followers with the vitality of the Mithraist creed. Tertullian in his De Corona, which he composed in the third Christian century, upbraids the Christians, inviting their attention to the Mithraists as examples. You, his fellow warriors, should blush when exposed by any soldier of Mithra. When he is enrolled in the cave, he is offered the crown, which he spurns, and he takes his oath upon this moment and is to be believed. Through the fidelity of his servants, the devil puts us to shame. Figure D, contemporary Mithra cult. One, sign of member. Two, sign for temple. Three, important meeting. Four, concentration symbol. Five, consecration symbol. Six, official seal. There were seven degrees of initiation in all, although there are some branches of the ecstatic side of the law which include certain others, making the total 12. After Lion came the Persian, then the runner of the sun, then father, and finally father of fathers. The 12th degree, it is said, is king of kings, and properly this can be held only by the supreme king and preferably the Shahin Shah, king of kings of Persia. This very ancient cult, from which more than one present-day secret society may well be derived, is thus seen to contain many of the elements which underlie organizations of this sort. It is a training system. It attempts to produce in its members a real or imagined experience of contact with some supreme power. The magical element is there too, shown in the belief in the power of certain names to achieve things which cannot be done by men. Mithraism was not an antisocial society in the sense that it did not conflict in its aims with the objectives of the countries in which it flourished. And hence it did not threaten the established order. It was tolerant of other creeds, which meant that it did not attempt to supplant them. Its greatest festival, the birth of the sun, on the 25th of December became Christianized and it is claimed by those who still believe in its mysteries and celebrate them that Christianity did not so much supplant Mithraism as absorb it, accepting some of its externals and diverting them to its own use. Perhaps incongruously, a present-day follower of Mithra in England recently likened this phenomenon to the eclipse of the Liberal Party. Because the two other parties have taken over its objectives and widened the basis, only the actual initiates of Mithra know what has been lost in the process. So the young man in the Phrygian bonnet, sometimes seen as the conqueror of the bull, or even as a man with a lion's head, still has his devotees, and the sun still shines. Now, thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.